Now, I'm not going to, uh, not going to give out any prizes for, uh, for guessing um, where Kim might have studied uh, yet another fine rural science graduate um, from UNE. A direct contemporary of mine, Kim, and I, so I can tell you she, uh, she did really well. Not for me, not so much, unfortunately. Um, and Kim's gone on and done a lot of work in genetics uh, in various areas. And sheep probably most recently, but uh, pigs, chickens, and I, I read here ostriches and oysters, Kim, so uh, I'm not sure how you phenotype an, an oyster other than a taste test, but um, obviously some pretty uh, broad and interesting experience there. And uh, Kim's really been focusing her work around reproduction, reproduction models, looking to tease apart the component traits of a number of lambs weaned and so forth. So um, very well credentialed to uh, now come and speak with us around uh, new reproduction RBVs. Kim, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Richard. I uh, actually started reproduction uh, with David in beef. Uh, so our first days to carving paper was done in 1998. So uh, a long history of reproduction. Now, I heard I'm doing this talk because I'm the most dispensable person in our uh, building, um, but I'm actually really happy to be talking about reproduction RBVs because it's been um, an outcome of a lot of work from a lot of people, all the way from uh, breeders in the industry uh, through to uh, the output from sheep genetics. <coughs> so just a quick outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to quickly go through why we want to change the current analysis and uh, what uh, data that we're using. I'm going to talk about features of the new analysis because it's not just about data, it's about how we actually use that data. Um, a little bit about the testing and um, just a, a tiny touch on some of the future plans and some of the barriers because if you listen to David carefully, you might have spotted that there's a couple of things that we might be able to do in sheep that we're not currently doing. Why change? Well, everything evolves, right? And it generally evolves as you get enough information to evolve it. So uh, we've gradually got to a situation where we're able to make better use and perform better analyses of reproduction data and uh, one of the really significant issues is that there are actually se several traits contributing to the outcome trait of number of lambs weaned. And each of the components of those could be having their own breeding value instead of you just having one value at the end. And if that's true, then you know what you're selecting for. You're able to value your change properly in the components that you're selecting for and we can make much better use of models and correlated traits to give you accurate breeding values for those components. And we've also had some recent developments which offer some really good opportunities. And these are developments that include data from the breeders, so more detailed data, um, some in-house software that's been written at AGBU, which um, is the engine for the genetic evaluation systems, and of course the accumulation of genomic information uh, through various projects. So I'll just go through these very briefly. If, if the key breeding objective trait is the number of lambs weaned, you can see it's not just a single thing. It's the end of a long cycle of uh, activities, and these include ovulation, conception, so appropriate behaviours of the ewe, embryo survival, uh, successful lambing, and actually getting that lamb through to weaning as a, a living lamb. And we use NLB as an indicator trait as well, because you can see that it's everything up to the point of lambing. So if we don't have weaning data, we've got NLB data, and it's useful when we don't have the weaning information. But in reality, there are three components. We've got conception at the top, here. We've got litter size, which is about ovulation rate and embryo survival, and down here, we've got whether the ewe can keep the lamb alive. Now you can see here, bigger lamb has had more trouble at lambing though. Does she keep it alive or not? A key issue with a phenotype called number of lambs weaned, number of lambs weaned, is that you can have a zero phenotype for two completely different reasons. The first reason is that you were infertile. No ovulation. The second reason is you lambed but you lost your lambs. Totally different cost structures, totally different welfare implications. Same phenotype. 
So the current phenotype masks the true extent of land losses. In addition, there are little points of time where people apply different management strategies. Now, if we don't separate those components, we can't deal with the fact that people have, might have applied different management um, interventions at different time points, which change the comparisons between females for the outcome. Regarding the valuing, um, on the bottom you can see uh, the litter size, the flux litter size mean, and you can see this is a graph of the relative economic value of, say, litter size versus lamb survival. And you can see here that as litter size increases, the value of increasing it further decreases because more lambs uh, means a higher risk of mortality for those lambs. And because of that, the relative economic value for lamb survival or year rearing ability, as we're going to talk about, uh, increases. So basically we do need to the capacity to select for these components independently and value them properly. So just to go through the definitions, we're going to have three phenotypes and the first one will be conception. Did she conceive or not? And we've put a proviso on this because uh, not everybody joins for a short joining period. And if you're allowing a very long joining period, it's not a very fair comparison to say, yes, she conceived, but it was 90 days after the ram entry versus yes, she conceived and it was within the first cycle. So we do actually adjust for that. And we will take that information from uh, lambs. We'll also use uh, dry tags and we'll use pregnancy scan information. And it's a very simple trade, it's yes or no. It's very important for yearling lambing because it's uh, actually picking up um, David's comment about puberty. It's less important obviously for mature use, but um, we analyse both. The second trait is litter size. So if you ewe lambs, how many lambs did you have? We prefer to drive that system from mothering up. And the reason we prefer to do it that way is because we get extra information. So things like date at birth, it enables things like maternal behaviour score, that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm focusing on maternal breeds here, so we're not talking about merinos at the moment. Um, and if we don't have lambs recorded, we will use pregnancy scan data. And that's a really good way of leveraging your data. So if you've got a bunch of pedigreed ewes that you're mating for commercial progeny, you don't need to know the parentage of the progeny, you just need to know the data on the ewe. That's de determined by uh, ovulation rate and embryo survival, as I mentioned, and it's obviously the number of lambs. Now, uh, I know there are concerns about the accuracy of scan data, but there should also be concerns about the accuracy of mothering up in some locations. It's really to the breeder to try and work out, uh, you know, where is the data going to be accurate to try and provide it in an accurate manner. And the third trait is how successfully did the ewe rear the lambs? Now, of course, the litter size provides a different challenge to the ewes as, as to whether they're going to be able to rear the lambs in the environment that they have them. For this trait, we insist that the lambs are recorded. We can't do anything if it's a scan-only data. Um, but once the lambs are recorded uh, and we have things like uh, dead at birth recorded and the rear type equals zero recorded to show that that animal didn't survive, then um, we can use that data. And we also want evidence of post weaning survival because we've discovered that a lot of people forget to update rear type equals zero for lambs which actually died. So this is always taken in context with litter size and it's basically a ratio. So if she has two lambs and they both survive, she's got a ERA of one. If she loses one, it's 0.5. And if she loses both of them, it's obviously zero. And it's always uh, in context of the litter size. And also, litter size, the challenge of the litter size itself is fitted in the model for analysis. So that we know 
uh, you know, there's different rates of survival for different litter sizes. <coughs> okay, what data? We have new data from breeders, and that is uh, to give us more information on joining details. Um, that includes things like dates, server size, and management groups for joining versus lambing. Um, we also get pregnancy scan data, which is clearly indicated as pregnancy scan data. And that is then aligned uh, properly with lambing outcomes because we have common contemporary group information for both those sources of data. And in that data, we also get new traits, which is maternal behaviour score and also pre-joining weight and condition. We also have new data preparation software and we have better filters by each of the component traits and also by contemporary group rather than year. This means we've managed to pull in a lot of data from both Australia and New Zealand now and it also helps us detect uh, contemporary group uh, related problems. And just with these changes, the current land plan analysis, which is something like 300,000 records, can be doubled. And most of that is through introducing information on litter size, but some of it is also through introducing records on land survival for flocks that previously didn't record fertility, so therefore they had no NLB or NLW data. And we have consistent contemporary groups across data sources, which is uh, something that's been a bit of a uh, difficulty to get, providing they have joining details. <coughs> We separate those traits into yearling and adult uh, traits and we use the post-weaning uh, fat depth, muscle depth so, and scrotal circumference measures uh, as correlated traits. And where I've got a tick, we're going to do that trait. Where I've got a cross, we're not going to do that trait. And where we've got a question mark, we're still unsure because we've not had enough data. The features of the new analysis is that we're applying better models. We're able to have explicit contemporary grouping and we've got two things here that are basically to do with the development um, trajectory of the animals. And these, these actually influence their performance. We don't do pre-adjustments. We're doing it directly from the data um, and we correct for things like age, uh, birth, birth type, rear type status, and also the litter size challenge for um, ewe rearing ability. And we're able to do this, which is a, a quite a big change from our previous systems, because we've got new software written by this man who's not actually here, Vincent. Uh, he's got a new baby in the house. And uh, that software is enabling us to get rid of um, pre-adjustments, which is a bit of a historical uh, requirement for us. And just as a, a bit of an example, this is what the UH effect is on litter size and lamb rearing ability estimated from the analysis and from the data. You can see that litter size peaks at the, for a six year old ewes. And you can see that after the age of six, the uh, ewes are struggling with their lamb survival. New genetic parameters are always required for these and you can see all of your repro traits are over here, yearling and adult on the left, they're always low. That doesn't mean you can't change them. It's about variation, not just about heritability. And all of these other traits as we would expect, maternal behaviour score, moderately heritable for adult use. We still haven't got enough data on yearling use for that. All these other traits are as expected and condition score over here more so for yearlings and adults in terms of heritability. I don't want to give you a pile of genetic correlations. The key information for the correlation estimates we have from maternal breeds so far, and this might differ for merinos, is that we know that yearling and adult expressions are very highly correlated for weights and condition scores, less so for some of the repro traits and particularly less so for conception in a yearling versus an adult ewe. Regarding weight, con condition score, carcass fat and muscle, they are very strongly correlated with each other, so they certainly tell you about condition and weight of the females, but they're actually fairly weakly correlated with reproduction. Um, the fed well effect is definitely evident. The bread well effect is 
more on the weaker side. And what that really supports is the fact that we need to record reproduction directly. You can't rely on correlated data for reproduction. And David showed you an example of that with the cattle. You would not pick the difference between those cows by looking at them. Um, and all those years of scrotal circumference measuring is uh, coming into use because we can certainly use it for reproductive performance of their uh, female relatives. The genomic information, well, we've got the single step analysis and that is the Rolls Royce for genetic evaluation. Um, but the trick with sheep is that there's many breeds and um, we've not really had to deal with that before in cattle. Uh, we do have to deal with it in sheep and it, that's required a fair bit of work because in, in genotypes the SNPs differ in frequency between the breeds and you have to make some adjust, adjustments to uh, the genomic relationship so that you develop a consistency between the pedigree and the genomic information. And that's taken quite a bit of work. The reason being, I'll show you, I'll give you a quick example. Here on your left hand side are some breeds and on your top are the percent of those breeds evidence from genomic data. You can see that your board lesters are fairly Puritan in their breeding, they're mostly board lester. But if we look at composites here, there's three types of composites reported here. You can see two of them are white Suffolk dominated and one of them is actually Coopworth dominated. So, and then down here, Coopworth, well, there's a bit of everything. But we need to have reference populations for each of those breeds in order to do this work. Now, the RBVs have been tested. And what we've done is we've taken the maternal data from 2000, we've, which has over 2 million do, um, animals in the pedigree, over 100 genetic groups, um, we've used the new models I've just mentioned and the new solar. We've done some test predictions where we, we say, Does the, do the sire breeding values predict their performance of their daughters? And they do. They work very, very nicely. And we've taken those RBVs to breeders to, for feedback and we've got feedback from the breeders on whether we did a good enough job with their data, getting the data into the system, and um, what did the breeding values look like? Did they make sense to those breeders? Just to show you uh, an example from one breeder, I've multiplied everything by 100 um, just to help you out a little bit here. But if we took the extremes just for this one breeder, as I said, you shouldn't worry so much about low heritability when you've got variability. The total extremes, if we took daughters from these, you could see that the daughters of the top versus the bottom sire would differ by 26% in yielding conception rate an 8% in yearling uh, adult conception rate. If we look at the lamb survival, top and bottom, 11% and 6%, that's not to be sneezed at. And if we pull it in and look at the 20 percentile bands, you've still got enough percent to be worth worrying about. You are getting genetic differences amongst size in these traits. If we look at extra lambs per 100 daughters, you can see that the very top versus the very bottom, close to 30 lambs difference in 100 daughters. Nothing to be sneezed at. So summary, improved data in terms of volume, quality, how we use it, um, the consistency uh, with regards to contemporary group and the component traits. Better models, better use of correlated traits to work with those components. We use the Rolls-Royce method, the single step method, and we account for the multi-breed nature of the data in the maternal breeds analysis. So you're going to get new RBVs for conception, letter size, lamb survival, or year rearing ability as we're calling it because it's the maternal side of the equation, maternal behaviour score and condition score. That's what you'll get. And we've been able to demonstrate we've got good predictive capacity um, and the breeder feedback has been reasonable. What about developments and barriers? Um, the data pipeline is an ongoing uh, issue and we're constantly working to try and improve the movement of data from the breeder through to us. It's not easy and involves a lot of people um, and Linton's going to talk further about that. David also highlighted a couple of traits that might be of interest to, 
to sheep breeders. Things like age at puberty. If you're interested in yearling lambing, a lot of that is to do with puberty. Um, so we have done things uh, regarding progesterone, which is uh, almost perfectly related to a scanning for corpus luteum, um, but we're not, uh, we haven't focused on anything in the pipeline particularly yet. One thing I would like to highlight is we've got many more flocks who come into this analysis now, and now that we're looking at the linkage, well, I can tell you linkage is going to be an issue. Breeders have to remember you have to keep daughters of introduced size in order to be connected for reproduction. And you need to record those daughters for reproduction in the same contemporary groups that you're recording your homebred daughters. So linkage will be an issue and we'll be looking more at that at the moment. And of course we've got um, constant ongoing technical developments that we need to keep on top of. So there's always better ways of doing things and we try and make sure that we're doing things the best way possible. Um, so, as I said, there's quite a team of people. Most of them are here um, this time around. Uh, they've been working hard for at least 10 years and um, I think we've finally got an outcome that everybody will be at least 90% happy with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, obviously, a lot of work gone into this area, a very important area, but also a very difficult area to work in. And uh, I think one of the parallels I saw there and something that I think is overlooked often is the, uh, we often think in reproduction of low heritabilities, but the, the counter to that uh, is very wide genetic variation. And I think that's something that people overlook quite often. Um, and both David and Kim have, have highlighted that. So Kim, let's have a look at a couple of questions that have come in from the fast uh, thumbs while you've been talking. Condition score, poorly correlated to reproduction. That's a question. Not a th oh, why am I surprised to see that? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's co poorly correlated genetically. It has weak genetic correlations. It has about the same magnitude of correlations from an environmental perspective, which is what you see with the um, fed well situation. So. Um, the way I try and think of it or try and explain it is if you are at a certain level of condition score, is it better to be genetically higher merit condition score or not? Now when we, when we analyse large data sets, if it was true that it was always beneficial to be higher genetic merit for condition score, we would always see a strong positive correlation, but we don't, because in certain situations it's actually a disadvantage to have a high condition score, or there's no merit in having a high gen condition score from, uh, you know, genetics. So the genetic correlations reflect what we see in the environments that are there and the production levels or the condition score levels of those breeds. Now, it might be quite different in merinos, it might be uh, beneficial in certain environments to have better condition score, and certainly people with the breeding values that you have for condition score, you can make those decisions and you can use them the way you see fit. But if you want to get reproduction, uh, accurate breeding values, you're not going to get it just from recording condition score you have to get it from recording reproduction. Strong message that's uh, been reinforced several times. Uh, if yeah. it's important to you, actually measure it. So Kim, uh, top question there. Will the, uh, now we're looking at the component traits, I guess we, they've been referred to of, of NLW. Will uh, they be combined into a repro index or is in fact NLW that index already? Uh, there will be some work on um, using the components in terms of an index. So at the moment we're, we're producing uh, RBVs and we have done some preliminary work regarding the relative economic values of those components, so it's, you, you can produce an index that way. Um, we've also looked at their alignment with what NLW is. The, the thing is though, as the, in the same way that the NLW phenotype can represent two completely different things, so infertility versus uh, lambs lost, you know, we want to have an index or the ability for you to use indexes that, that relate to your production level and your client's production levels. So if your client's production levels are already quite high for litter size, they're going to be more interested in you working on the lamb survival part of it. 
Thanks, Kim. Now, getting right into some technical bits of, uh, of the analysis process. Um, the responsibility for fitting the contemporary groups, uh, what combination comes it's, together in that? Yeah, it's a combination. So breeders need to be telling us when they're managing animals differently, which is no different to how any other trait um, is received. You tell us how you manage your animals. Uh, we fit certain things in the model that we know are important, but which some breeders tell us about and some breeders don't. And they're already in the data, so we can easily build them straight into the model and we're doing it on a flock by flock basis which means that um, if your flock is different to somebody else's flock we're not trying to say that uh, a yearling versus an adult ewe has the same impact in your flock as it did in somebody else's flock. So uh, we are building uh, things on top of what the breeders are telling us to take into account the main um, impacts of the tra trajectory of development and history in a, a female's performance. So with regards to the, uh, the conception uh, uh, breeding value, a tease is taken into uh, account in, the, in that? Uh... No, uh, teases aren't, but if you, were, if you had contemporaries where one set had teases and one set didn't, then clearly that's going to be a management group difference because you've changed the way you're priming those females for um, mm. their reproductive performance. So uh, teasers specifically aren't taken into account, but you, you, as a breeder you would be telling us uh, about management group differences that relate to things like that. Um, well, there's another one with teasers there, so let's continue on that uh, theme, Kim, with respect to uh, teasers with a harness and uh, trying to record that with respect to age at first uh, estrus. I have actually just been involved in a project where we uh, use teasers with uh, a large number of use um, and then we also had uh, fetal ageing data and we also mothered up and um, there were uh, about 10% of females weren't actually recorded by the teaser who clearly got pregnant from some uh, interaction. Um, there were quite a number of uh, records which had to be corrected because the lambing date clearly not, did not reflect what had been recorded as the date of the teaser's interaction with that animal. I'd be more inclined to use uh, fetal age scanning than I would be uh, teaser dates because uh, you, get, you get all of the use with records, uh, plus there tends to be a little bit less error associated with some of the um, harness results. Okay, thank you. So we'll just whip the, through these last two before we wrap up, Kim. Um, so uh, putting your breeder hat on, um, how would you use these new, uh, new breeding values from a uh, breeding maternal traits in your flock? Uh, um, well, that would depend on my clients. Um, I think litter size is by far the easiest trait to select for, and that is what a lot of people have done inadvertently with number of lambs weaned. Now, um, that's fine if the ewes are keeping the lambs alive well, but if they're not keeping the lambs alive well, then I would be shifting focus towards uh, looking for better breeding values on lamb survival at the same time. It is possible to get both of those things together. There is a, uh, an antagonistic relationship between litter size and lamb survival, as you would expect, um, but it's not, um, it's certainly from a genetic perspective, it's not super strong. It's it can be managed by appropriate selection. So I would be making use of combining those two things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, we'll just wrap up on that last question, Kim, in the interest of time. Obviously, there's some interest. We've been talking about the, the yeah. maternal group, breed groups. Um, obviously, interest from the, the merino industry in this space as well. Yeah. What's coming uh, for them? Yeah, so um, a lot of the elements that we've um, had to put together for the maternal analyses uh, we'll also um, transfer, say, for example, the same model and structure through to merinos. But um, one of the difficulties is that merinos are probably more interested in using SCAN as their dominant form of uh, information source rather than mothering up. Uh, there are certainly are flocks that do fully mother up, um, which provide valuable data. So uh, I think with re regards to data processing we've probably got a bit of work to do there to try and work out the best way of combining those sources and we also have to um, re-estimate the parameters specifically for merinos um, particularly regarding uh, the conditions for relationships because I know there's a lot of thought that the relationship should be a lot stronger 
uh, in merinos than perhaps they are in maternal reefs. So we will certainly be looking at all of those and we will be having specific uh, parameters that reflect the different populations. So it could, could be a little while yet. Um, uh, there was mention of how many databases are present uh, and each database has its own set of uh, problems and issues to deal with. So uh, until we get into the Merino one specifically, again, um, I would hate to uh, say a timeline, but I don't think it will be 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope not. Please join me in thanking Kim for that presentation and discussion.